Last week, it was Mother's Day here in the UAE. And the week before that, I think it was Mother's Day in the UK. It's not Mother's Day in Australia until May, so it's completely off my radar. But it was also the International Women's Day earlier in March. And so today, we are going to honour mothers and we want to honour women. Now, I know that Mother's Day can bring up so many emotions for people. Some people, when they hear the phrase Mother's Day, they get a little knot in their stomach and it may be a sense of uneasiness. And that could be from so many different reasons. And I just want to acknowledge those feelings now and say that it's actually okay to feel all that. But I want to read this poem as a way to acknowledge everyone here today. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make things harder. To those who are foster mums, mentor mums and spiritual mums, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of their own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisaged lavishing love on children, on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. So happy Mother's Day to everyone here at City Hill. We have so many wise women in our church, women who are like mothers to us when we are far from home and missing our maternal mothers, women who are spiritual giants in our lives. And we're so grateful for that here in City Hill and we're so thankful for each woman here. We have women who mentor, who love and who bless us in many different ways. And the women in our church have so much to impart. Yep, I can see names coming up and I absolutely agree. Today we're going to host a little bit of a panel and we're going to um, talk to some women in our church. Now, I'm pretty sure I could have interviewed every woman in our church today and I believe that we would have been touched by their words and by their stories, but we don't actually have that much time. So... We're going to um, just hear from, I think we'll have some screens come up soon. We're going to just, I'm going to ask some questions of different women in our church. Now, most of the ladies who will be coming up now, most of these ladies are wives of the elders. Um, they're not all married to one elder. They're all married to different elders. But, um, and some of them are just wives of different leaders in our church. So if we were in church, I'd say give them a round of applause as they come up and we can do that. We'll clap them on. And I'm really thrilled that um, they're joining us 
this morning. You can see, yeah, that's great. We've got the women who I was talking about, the women who mentor us, who love us, and who bless us, and who have so much to impart. So we're going to hear from this panel of ladies this morning. And to start off with, I'm going to ask them all a very simple question. If you could go somewhere to get away, where would you go? We talked about this earlier and some of you said you'd go to the bathroom because that's the best and easiest place to get away to at the moment. But other than the bathroom, where else would you go to get away if you could? Um, I'll just say your names and you just say your answer afterwards. Emily? Somewhere like Russell Kaima. Okay. Connie? Actually, my daughter and I dream about having a holiday just for the two of us. <laughs> if, if not in Paris, a staycation in Russell came on. Okay. You're allowed to dream big, ladies. It's okay. <laughs> uh, Pixie, where would you go? I would go to Fajera. Fajera is a very scenic place. And we've got happy memories there. Good. Uh, Jeanette, where would you go? For me, it is Austria. Um, very happy memories there. So definitely would like to go back there. Yeah, Dorcas? Yeah, I would like to go to Belgium because I have a family there that I would like, I would love to visit. Yes. Great. Charity and then Susie. I have a staycation with my girls at, on an island somewhere, just the three of us. Yeah. Susie's having trouble with her um, unmuting abilities there. Okay, try again, Susie. All right, yeah. I think I would just like to go anywhere, get away from here. But right now I just want to go back home and meet my family. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, now I'm going to ask a few more serious questions. And the first questions I'm going to ask Susie to answer first and then Charity afterwards. And the question is, what is your favorite thing about being a woman? I think for me, about being a woman, I think is to be a mother. And uh, I think that's the, yeah, my best thing about being a woman. My favorite thing to be a woman is that uh, we are the last born of God's creation but we came first in most of God's agenda and to break a lot of protocol. And when you look at the, the accounts of a, a great women in the Bible, they were pay setters and God has given we women a, a, a great heart to be a mother, to be a wife, to be a sister, to be mentors, to a lot of, even the men. And looking at how we became a pay setters, even in God's agenda, the first thing we did was wrong, that is to break the, the law of God, that is Eve eating the fruit that he was told she was told not to eat. But it was through a woman, Mary, who brought the Savior to bring reconciliation to mankind. And when you look at what God have used women in the Bible to do, it's my favorite thing because when you look at a, a the first person God gave a lot of responsibility to in the Bible was a woman. She was a mother, she was a prophetess, she was a songwriter, she was a warrior, and she was a, a, a whole lot of things. And the other woman, God, who was a pacer for us as women that we look up to was a root. Ruth became the, 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 the pace setter for uh, we, the Gentiles, to become part of God's promises, that he was not part of it. He came from a tribe that did not be, was not part of God's children. But she broke all the protocol, and she saw something in her mother-in-law and decided to follow her, and she became uh, the, the pathway or the, uh, for us, the Gentiles, to become God's, uh, uh, to inherit God's pr uh, promises. Look at Hannah. Hannah became a pace setter. He knew what God wanted and what she also wanted. So she bargained and exchanged with God and told God, God, you need a prophet. I need a son. So give me a son and I'll give you a prophet. And she gave God a prophet. And look, looking at uh, 
the, the account of women in, who had ministry with God. Women were so vital in Jesus' ministry. And the first disciple Jesus had was Mary Magdalene, and she met her. And the first person Jesus revealed himself to as the Messiah was a woman at the well. And when you look at the account, Mary Magdalene also was the first person to perceive that Jesus's body need, needed to be embalmed. And therefore she poured oil on her to pre preserve her body. And so women have become so many, it became so uh, uh, first in a lot of God's agenda to us. So it's, that is what motivates me to say that we, we are, uh, makes me to be uh, encouraged to be a woman. Looking at Dorcas, she was the first person to die that the, the whole nation cried. They didn't want her to go away and they called forth and she came back to life because of her good work. Look, looking at the uh, 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 Jesus' resurrection, it was women who met her, him first and saw that he has resurrected from the grave. So we are the firstborn of God's creation, but we became peacemakers and first in a lot of God's agenda. And it makes me proud and privileged that God is using us women to be life givers, to carry life. That is the very favorite thing that we can be the life givers of God's creation, that we carry life and make life with God. That is what is the favorite thing I like about being a woman. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Thanks, Charity. I think we could just about stop there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. I feel empowered and I feel like, yeah, we're going to be used, ladies. Okay, um, next question that I have um, for Connie and for Susie. Who is an inspirational person in your life other than Charity? We know she is someone different. <laughs> you know, I've uh, been inspired by so many women in church and in our city group and, you know, I... They inspire me on a daily basis. But the one who really stands out for me is my mother. Because as I was growing up, our home was uh, always open. And, uh, you know, our friends could come home and she just wanted our home to be a safe place for all the young people to gather. And, uh, and she would cook for them and she would really look after them. And if they had a problem, they could go and talk to her and she was always available. And even if it is to go and sit with people in the hospital to spend days and nights with them or to go to their house and pray for them and to give them food or just to look after them in any way, you know, she's always there. And uh, even and now she's 80. And even now, you know, this is what she's doing. It's only that COVID has come in and hampered uh, her from going out and doing this. But now, since she can't go out, she's on the phone and there are people who are calling her. And that's the way she looks after people now. You know, she prays with them over the phone. And, and uh, yeah, she's been a truly, uh, she's been such an inspiration to me. Her sacrifice, her selflessness, you know, has taught me so much and, and yeah, there is so much of love that she keeps giving and yeah, that has taught me so much. And yeah, she is truly an inspiration. Over to you, Connie. Thanks, Susie. For me, my parents, my mom, mainly my mom, I can say she was an epitome of love. She lived her life for her children and then for grandchildren. Her family was a world and her life revolved around it. She was kind and generous to everyone. Actually, in our neighborhood, the people used to call her Amma, Amma means mother. Sorry. Wow. Um, just hearing from both of you and the, your mothers sound beautiful and amazing and I'm sure we all wish that we could meet them. Beautiful. Um, Actually, she, she yes. was a mother, sorry, she was a mother to many of them. Her love was like selfless and it's like a sacrificial. Mm. 
Yeah. And that's the legacy she left behind when she died at the age of 76 in 2004. So I believe it's important for us to leave a legacy. In order to leave a legacy, we need to live a legacy. Yes, that's beautiful. So true. Very true. Um, Emily, the next question is for you. What is one cause or injustice in the world you wish you could fix? Uh, I wish I could uh, fix the discrimination in this world. Uh, as um, no matter what is the gender you are and uh, which country you come from or what color your skin is and what age group that you're from and all of your uh, disability in this world, everyone should be treated equally as we are all made in the same image of God. I wish I could fix that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something I suppose that we can now teach to our children and try and instill in our children so that there is change in the generations to come. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. Um, Pixie, you're next. Pixie, I've got two questions for you. What are you learning about yourself lately and what is the hardest thing about this season of your life? Hi, first of all, hello, CTL. I love and miss you all so much. Miss giving all the nice hugs but, and getting all the nice hugs but one day soon. Okay, the first question, what am I learning about myself lately? I think what God has taught both Harold and I and the kids is uh, the importance of being content with in whatever season you are in your life. And uh, because I feel contentment is, is, um, uh, is a state of, uh, it's an attitude that you can have. If you have a positive attitude, you can be happy in whatever situation. Many have said that, you know, that I would be happy if I have a better job or uh, uh, the, uh, when I get married, but that's not the case. It's how you, what you tell yourself is. And the scripture I have for that, that is 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we are content with that and God has taught us as we wound up our big house and moved into a studio apartment with Isaac and Susie. The second and most hard, hard, hardest thing about this season of your life, oh, for sure it is the waiting and not knowing when we will go. Uh, the transition is, is very difficult and uh, the importance of waiting on God and not running ahead of God's timing. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Pixie. Um, Jeanette, you're next. I have a quest, two questions for you as well. What is the hardest thing about this season of your life? And also, how do you stay connected to God through the week? Hi, Sadiel. Uh, for me, uh, the hardest part of the season actually spans back a few years when I had to, when I left my job. Uh, it was something that just a little background. I started work when I was in my teens. So work had been the one constant in my life. Um, I, I studied with work, I did everything else with work being the constant. So when I had to leave my job, there was a lot of uh, frustration. I felt stressed. I felt I did not feel independent. I felt a lot of things. And and I did not realize that this was, you know, God, uh, you know, putting a stop to that race that I was running, like, like I had nothing else, you know. And, um, you know, I, I did not realize this is for a larger good. Um, kids were struggling. Um, uh, Zach's health was not doing very well. Um, Anushka had withdrawn. She used to sit in her room and, you know, just so... When I when this uh, thing came in, when I had to, uh, you know, circumstances were put in such a way that I had to quit. Um, I was I was upset. I was praying and I was asking God, what is this for? And I did not realize that this was a preparation for me for, uh, you know, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. Um, children's school uh, was online. Um, I was needed there. If I was working, that would have not been my priority. 
this then became my priority. I, I never wanted to be a teacher, but God just trained me and allowed me to be a teacher, you know, to them. Then, of course, um, Anisha's uh, uh, COVID, I was 100% at home to, you know, take care of him. Uh, for me, this season, why is it difficult is because there was change. I knew life in a certain way and it changed for me completely. Uh, job was not the priority of my life. My family became priority. And I believe that this was, you know, God teaching me and but with love, you know, and uh, teaching me that uh, there is seasons in your life, Janet, you need to stop. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true for a lot of us, actually. That's yeah, yeah. really great. Thank you. Um, to yeah. follow on from that, Dorcas, could you tell us how you stay connected to God through the week? Yeah, for me, I'm able to stay connected to God throughout the week by observing um, a quiet time, which I was trained to do when growing up, that... Um, before I start my day, I need to study the word of God, have time for prayer, have time for worship before I take my breakfast. So we had a phrase, NBNB, which means no Bible, no breakfast. So I was trained on that, that I always have to, as much as I remember to take breakfast, I also have to remember to study the word of God. And that has really helped me a lot. It has really made me a better person that I need to grow my spirit as well as as much as I always live to eat, to make sure my body looks healthy. My spirit man also had to be fed. So I try as much as possible to go by that MB and B that said uh, no Bible, no breakfast. And then it has really built me up. It has really helped me growing up. And that is how I'm able to stay connected to God at all time mm. throughout the week. Yes. Thank Good. you. NB, NB. I think we all need to put that like on our fridge or something. Excellent. Um, I have skipped over lots of questions. I had lots more planned, but as per as usual, as expected, when you put lots of ladies together, we do could talk for hours. But I want to end with one question for charity. Are there any assumptions about women that you'd like to change? Yes, for us women to know that it doesn't matter who you are, whether married or not, you are in God's agenda, you are in God's purpose. It is not what you have achieved that makes you who you are, but who God have created you to be, knowing that you are there to be a voice, a, a carer, or an inspiration to somebody. Like the women in the Bible, it's not everybody that was married. Sometimes we women think if we are not married, we don't have an identity, but that is not it. We knowing that we are part of God's agenda, what God has a purpose for everybody, we are part of it, so we should not look down on ourselves, whether we are educated or not, we are in God's plan. That is what the assumption I would want to change, to empower women to get on board with what God has given to them, whether little or big. It doesn't matter. Others, we, we men sometimes think, oh, I don't have a platform, so I cannot do what God has called me to do. Whether you have a platform or not, in your own small way, you can serve God there. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Now, we wanted to tie this up. We're talking about Easter. And I was talking to the, the ladies last week about what Easter looked like for them when they were growing up. And I want you, everyone in City Hill, can now think back to what Easter was like for you growing up. For some of you, you came from cultures where it was not even discussed, talked about, there was nothing at all. Um, for us in Australia, it was very, it's very much commercialised and it was when I was growing up as well. And basically it turns into the celebration of the Easter Bunny. And I had to explain the Easter Bunny to some people during the week because they were like, well, why, why a bunny? And I said, well, I'm not really sure why a bunny. The bunny brings the eggs. But bunnies don't lay eggs, so I'm not really sure why we have a bunny. And the other thing that's turned into in Australia is that it's all about the holiday. 
we have a long weekend. It's a public holiday. It's, you know, that's really what we talk about. And you'll hear people talk about the Easter holidays because that means you're going to go on a holiday. And that's what we did as children. We would often go on holidays. My parents would take us camping to the foot of the snowy mountains and where it was freezing cold and we were sleeping in tents and we'd spend our days climbing through caves and abseiling and doing all those sorts of outdoor things. Um, and we also loved the Easter eggs. I always got Easter eggs and the best thing when we were home for Easter was that my sisters and my brother and I would fill our pockets and our bags with Easter eggs to take to church and then we'd spend the whole church service making that foil unwrapping noise and then fighting over which egg we wanted because they all tasted different. And so it would be like, if you got that one, I want that one. With the, our mum giving us you know, the church look of, you know, yeah. And we've all given it or have received it, I'm sure. So that's what Easter was like for me. But I just wanted to hear from Connie one little story about what Easter looks like for her, a special family tradition that they had. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Actually, I'm coming from a Catholic background. So for us, Good Friday was a day to mourn. You know? So we used to fast. And my mom used to make some special meal for dinner with no meat. It's something like a rice porridge called kanji. <laughs> and Easter day was a day to feast. That also my mother used to make some special food for you know, lunch and dinner, something special. But this tradition didn't run for long in my family, my little family. <laughs> Hannah told us that, she, that Connie tried to give them that special um, Easter Friday breakfast and they were like, no, this is not going to happen, mum, forget it. <laughs> So their tradition didn't last very long at all. Um, so we, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we're running out of time, so I'm going to cut it short. We, but I do want to encourage you to ask each other what their Easter traditions was like because it is quite interesting. Because we come from so many different countries and so many different cultures, we have so many different stories and ways that we celebrate it. Some of you are out looking for Jesus in the streets. I've never heard of that but you probably haven't heard of my traditions either. So let's share our cultures and share our traditions. Um, to end with, I wanted to say that we are surrounded by the commercialism of Easter. And as a parent, one of the things that I have tried to do is to turn the commercialism around into something that points my children to Jesus, however it might be. And I've got here today an egg, and I just wanted to... It's a very simple explanation. You may all know this already, but when we have eggs in our house, particularly the hollow ones, I like to remind my children that, yep, the egg, I'm going to try and break it, the egg is hollow. Why is it hollow? It's because Jesus is no longer in the tomb. So let's do, I mean, we can't avoid commercialism. We can't avoid seeing the Easter bunny and the Easter eggs around, but we can take power over that and turn it and point our children to Jesus and the real meaning of Easter in all that we do. So let's remind each other and remind our children that Jesus did rise from the dead and that's something to be celebrated. The tomb is empty. There's nothing inside because Jesus is no longer there. Okay, very, very simple, but hopefully it helps someone. Ladies, thank you so much. I wish we could keep talking all day, but I think we'd probably see that the numbers decline quite quickly because they won't be as interested as we are. But please take time to talk to each other later and um, ask each other some of these questions as well. I'm going to hand over to Abednego because he's going to pray for the mothers and pray for the women in our church. Thank you, um, Lady Katie, and thank you all ladies um, who, who have made today very special. I think um, we've all... I mean, everybody here has been impacted by a lady in this life. And I just thought I start my prayer with um, um, a reading from Proverbs chapter 31, 25 to, 30, to 31, yeah. And it's all about praises to women. And it says, she's clothed with strength and dignity. 
and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. So ladies of City Hill, we publicly declare your praises. We're saying you're wise, you are elegant, you are sacrificial, you are strong, you are ambidextrous, you are bold, you are reliable, you are graceful, you are beautiful, and we cannot just find enough words to describe you, ladies of City Hill. If you're a man and you have a lady around you, why don't you put your hand around her? And if you don't have, just put your hand, just stretch your hand over your over the screen and let's Yes, thank you, Uncle Frank. And let's pray. <laughs> let's pray with our ladies. Let's pray into their lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such gorgeous women that you put around her, around us, especially the women of City Hill. We praise you because you formed them wonderfully, because you formed them so fearfully. We pray their lives will be wholly devoted to you, Lord. We pray that you wrap them with your love, God. We pray that they will grow closer and closer to you each day. We pray that you fuel their desire to seek after you and to long after you, Lord. We pray that in every day that the sun rises, you fuel them with new strength to be more like Christ, God. We pray that you give them more strength to live exemplary lives, God. We pray for fruitfulness in their lives. We speak victory in their endeavors, Lord, and we speak freedom, God. We pray courage, God, courage to step into situations where they are needed and courage to step into situations that holds them from being what you call them to be, God. We ask that in every challenge that they are experiencing, God, you give them peace, God. You strengthen their hearts. You give them courage, God. You protect them with wisdom and grant them peace and incredible peace within God. We pray that you remove everything that competes, Father, with the peace and the joy and the strength that you, you Christ, has given to them, God. We pray that every woman in City Hill will be known for few things, that one, they are your daughters, two, they are children of the word, three, they live exemplary lives, and and so many things that all points back to you, God. We pray that in, especially in household where we only see women who have risen up and they're standing in faith and crying God to you, that the rest of their family will see you and will know you or return to you. We pray that that prayer will be answered, God. Answer their prayer, hear them and answer their prayer. Let their household experience the salvation that they are experiencing and the work they are seeing, God. We pray just like in 25, Psalm 25, that you help them to know your ways, that you teach them to walk in your paths, that you lead them in truth and you lead them in everything that they do. We pray, Father, that the women of City Hill will be like Sarah, they will be like Deborah, like Ruth, like Hannah, and all the exemplary, like Esther, like um, like Mary, um, Mary, like Elizabeth, Elizabeth, like like Priscilla, like Dorcas, and so many examples that we see in the Word in the Bible. We pray that women of City Hill will be of such God. We thank you for placing them strategically, purposefully, and 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 what other word? Just placing them in our lives, God. And we give you praise, and we praise them for being the women that they are. We just love them. And um, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.